this uh, uh, my name is Atya and I am the communications lead for SARE, South Asia Regional Energy Hub, uh, and uh, uh, who is organizing this event as part of USAID South Asia Regional Energy Partnership. Now, uh, I'm taking on going to take on the role of MC for today's session as well for the energy series. And this is part one of the theme on electricity trader and distribution entities uh, perspective on the ways in which energy data analytics can be harnessed for decision making in the power sector. So I would like to welcome each and every one of you, including the panelists, as well as the attendees for taking out time uh, for this pivotal session today. So today, uh, so just to give you a quick background about uh, the hub and what it does. Uh, so South Asia Regional Energy Hub, SARE as we call it, is a platform for communication and collaboration established by USAID India to support the implementation of Clean Edge Asia in South Asia. Now, Clean Edge Asia in South Asia was an initiative started by the U.S. Uh, uh, government to promote sustainable and secure energy markets across the Indo-Pacific regions. So as a knowledge service platform, uh, SARE organizes regular sessions for our stakeholders to provide communication services. Uh, and South Asia energy series today's session uh, series energy series is one of the uh, key offerings that we uh, provide for you know uh, if for providing insights on the topics of interest in the areas of energy sector so likewise we have also uh, organized other uh, events like master classes just yesterday we held the first session on the topic of uh, green hydrogen financing in south asia um and uh, uh, with that i conclude my introduction for sari um i would like to i would invite pramod who is uh, going to be the moderator for today's event to explain a little bit about the background of this particular uh, uh, webinar uh, the session that we are organizing and what will be the agenda for today's so i hand it over to you pramod are there we had the sequence i think it has I changed yeah so uh, anyway, uh, I know the sequence has changed. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, since Manali, ha, hi Manali, I'm already online, okay. and uh, I can just go before promote goes if it makes sense. Promote? Yes. Yeah. Yes, okay, exactly. great. Yeah. Definitely. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, we are sorry for the delays and a bit of glitches uh, in joining. Uh, Some of the Zoom thing did not work today, although it's almost always so efficient but uh, yeah as uh, as a context setting which uh, uh, probably adya did um, usaid is organizing this series as a part of um, you know uh, usaid's platform coordination and communication platform called south asia regional energy hub one of the mandates of uh, the sare program is is to organize energy series on topics, discussion topic, uh, on topics that are, for, are of relevance and importance for the South Asian stakeholders. And data obviously has emerged out to be one of the most important uh, pieces of information uh, which, uh, which we see. I mean, much more than the importance of data is much more now going, growing slowly more than even, you know, um, uh, money. I mean, I say if you have data, you can really mine it and you can really become use it, uh, use it to your advantage. So uh, the purpose of uh, the energy series, three part energy series is on data analytics and promote the, will be giving you a, uh, a lot more information about how we are planning to do it. But from USA perspective, this is definitely one of the um, important aspects which we are saying not only in terms of you know analytics but more in terms of how do we improve um, data reporting how do we improve collection of data reporting it in a format which is understandable and then how do we in, enhance the use of this data which is being you know mined by which is being collected 
all over the place so as to improve the efficiencies in the system, in power market performances, in trading, in, uh, in, uh, in just improving your efficiencies, improving customer care services. So there are so many things which you can do with the data perspective per se. So we are hoping the three-part series would be very helpful for you to understand and uh, get a perspective of some different speakers or stakeholders who will be presenting about uh, uh, you know, this very important topic. Um, as I'm on the road and also I don't want to stand between you and the, uh, the, the content part of the energy series, I am going to you know, hand it back to uh, Pramod. I hope that you will find it useful. Again, as always I mentioned, your feedback and your, uh, you know, uh, general feedback on the content of the program, the way it was organized, the speaker would be very much useful for for helping us curate the energy series, which is much more effective and meaningful. If you have any themes or topics you would like us, uh, you know, you said Sari's program to be uh, conducting energy series on, so please do. Um, Put in your feedback, comments in the comment box. And this is a three-part series. So I hope to, uh, you know, come back in the part two and part three and also get some bit, bit of feedback from you. Uh, with that, um, we are really happy um, and are thankful to all the three speakers who will be speaking as a part of these series. And uh, with that, let me turn it back to Pramod uh, for kickstarting the discussion or kickstarting this part of the series. Over to you. Uh, I would take over, uh, uh, Pramod, all right with you. Yeah, thank you so much for that, uh, uh, you know, welcoming remarks and putting a context to this session, uh, Monali. Uh, before I introduce our moderator for the session, I would like to invite everyone for a quick group picture, um, uh, especially the panelists, and then later on the, uh, uh, the attendees as well. So if I can ask all of you to switch on your video, that will help us for this group. And then we will uh, get on with uh, in the introduction of uh, the moderator and this session, please. So here we go. Uh, Bhumika, would you want to uh, switch on your video, please? Yeah, hopefully you should be able to see me. Uh, it's blank as of now. Just just a quick one. Otherwise, I'm... Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. There you go. There you go. So there we are. Thank you so much, panelists, uh, and thanks, Manali. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, stay on, please. In that case, I would like to introduce our moderator now uh, to take over the session uh, and also introduce the speakers. Uh, I would like to inform all the participants that today's session is getting recorded. Uh, so uh, there's no need for... Uh, you know, taking on frantic notes because this is getting recorded and will be presented to you uh, in a follow-up uh, emails, including the presentations of our speakers today. So uh, please ensure that you are all on mute, continue to be on mute, and uh, we uh, do not have any, but please stay on uh, until the end of the session because we have an interesting knowledge assessment uh, plan towards the very end for our participants. So stay tuned for that. So without any further delay, let me introduce our moderator for the session, Mr. Pramod Thakur. He is the power trade uh, expert at Sarif. He has approximately 18 years of experience in industry and consulting role within the energy sector in South Asia. His focus uh, lies in power trading, power markets, and cross-border electricity trade. Uh, he has done his B.Tech in electricity, uh, electrical engineering, I'm sorry, and has uh, provided his expert advice to utilities on IT enablement in generation, transmission, and distribution related areas. So I welcome him to introduce our speakers and provide an overview of the agenda for today's session. Over to you, Pramod. Pramod, are you able to, you are on mute, Pramod. Yeah, sorry for the uh, glitches. Um, so without taking much time, I'll just introduce you with... Oh, 
Okay, so uh, welcome to this energy series and uh, on energy data analytics for decision making. Um, I'll be just sharing you the program plan and what we have in future, uh, what, what all things we are planning to cover. Uh, so giving you the context, uh, uh, basically in the South Asian market is changing very fast. And uh, if you see the country like Nepal, they have been trading bilaterally with India and uh, uh, periodically they have been uh, recently very recently in last two three years they have been periodically buying and selling power through the power exchanges and becomes uh, and and now they have become next ex exporter from net, net importer similarly if you see the case of bhutan they have been consistently exporting the power to uh, india but uh, in last two years they have also been buying power through the power exchange market and also their peak demand in the last three years have almost doubled. So uh, there has been a very significant changes. Also, they are selling power through this uh, power exchanges route. Uh, in case of India, the power exchange based trade is close to 7-8%. And also, there are other mechanisms through which a majority of the trade is happening. And there is a rapid increase in the renewable energy portfolio by India. And this is also changing the market dynamics in Indian context. Also, there are various regulatory changes which are happening. Uh, in last one year, you, you might have seen a lot many changes which are coming in Indian regulatory landscape. The market is changing, the regulations are changing, the operating procedures are changing, which is impacting everyone. Uh, in case of Bangladesh also, they have been uh, consistently trading uh, through the bilateral trades, but they are also, uh, their domestic gas is depleting and they are now dependent on imported gas and coal-based power plants. And they are also evaluating some of the options to buy or sell power through the Indian power exchanges. Uh, if you go to the Sri Lanka, there also renewable energy is one of the main focus area and the discussions on connecting through the cross-border electricity trade with balanced South Asian market is at very advanced stage. Uh, so all these are leading to basically creating a lot many concerns in the South Asian markets. The demand is changing very significantly. Uh, there is a variation in the generation. So uh, earlier, the generation used to be very high, specifically for case of uh, the hydro-based generation. Also, there is a variability which has come because of the uh, renewable. Um, uh, there is an adoption in the technology which has come in the South Asia region. At different country has a different level of adoption. But this has increased a lot, uh, created a lot of data. Also, there are market opportunities. So at very cheaper price, also the power, power is available. And, and it is available and there is a selling option also. Uh, in addition to this, the power market structure, policies, regulations are changing very periodically. And there is a, a lot of infrastructure in relating to smart metering, operating data availability relating to the SCADA and other system, as well as the enterprise related information is also available. And the most important aspect is the consumer's expectation is changing in, in, in this region. All this requires us to basically do the generation forecasting very accurately. Also, the demand has to be assessed at very uh, minute scale. So currently, it is being done at 15 minutes time scale in, in case of India. And other, uh, other participants also do it in the same manner. Also, a, a lot of uh, effort on the power system planning and operations is required and how the costing will impact and interpreting a lot of data which is being generated through the market side. So all this requires us to develop an understanding on energy data analytics. And because of that session, we, because of that requirement, we have scheduled this session. So uh, key objectives of these series would be to enhance the institutional capacity in the region, specifically focused on the policymakers, regulators, utilities, private sector organizations, uh, also to increase the awareness of the practices, tools, technologies, uh, and the practical uh, use cases through which they, uh, they have, uh, the various entities have got benefited using the energy data analytics, and also to create a data-driven decision-making culture in the South Asia region. So uh, I'll just give you a brief uh, overview of the maturity model, which is there in the uh, data analytics model. So wherein some of the organizations may be at the very nascent stage and some are at the visionary stage. But I'm sure that all, all the uh, entities in the South Asia will be falling somewhere in between and on, on different scales. So 
generally at the nascent stage there is a very low level of analytical uh, awareness uh, there are stand alone dashboards which are available and uh, they, there are separate processes which are unlinked are being followed at the second stage which is a pre adoption stage there is a strategic plan which is in place by any organization also there is a some level of technical capability which is being there and there is a however there is a low level of data integration among various functions and tools and hr skills the human resource skills is also very low at the maturity level any organization will have a very strategic and scalable technological capability also it will be using it for the entire organization it will not be a stand alone for example for the power market department or the power uh, buying or selling department also the commercial department the finance department all the de departments will be interlinked uh, in addition to this the processes and the business model will be basically based on the data uh, in case of visionary or which is the topmost layer wherein the great uh, and the significant business value is being derived from the analytics and there is a automatic and advanced machine learning technologies are being used so i am sure uh, all of your organization will be falling somewhere maybe some of them will be at visionary stage uh, and some are reaching to there so uh, through the usaids program our vision would be that you should gain the knowledge and also develop your own tools and technology and we continue to share the best practices with all of you similarly there is a, a, there is a capability framework in which the organization needs to have a clear vision and strategy there is a customer as, as well as the regulatory readiness for adopting to such technology uh, in terms of data the strategy quality and governance are the key important areas which needs to be prepared i am sure uh, many of the it entity the entities uh, the it departments in 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 respective entities might have done some work on this uh, in terms of technology you, we need to choose very uh, specific tools for a specific purpose and also understand the architecture and infrastructure uh, related matters to to this and uh, one the most important aspect is the organization structure whether you have a separate department handling this analytical capability the decision making is being done based on this data where you have the data analyst or the engineers are being trained to util use this information for the business use case is something where wherein a lot of work has to be done and uh, on the analytical adoption there can be in practice progress or in progress or maybe you can also adopt something which in is in there in the future so this framework is usually being used by various entities to judge where they are currently lying uh, some of the critical success factors for uh, implementing the data uh, analytics in the organization includes the specifying the business objectives cultivating the data driven culture Uh, selecting a suitable suitable technology or partner for scalability and also identifying the quality data quality related issues and integrating the gaps and one uh, the most important aspect is the data governance of it and uh, one of the critical questions which everyone ask in the public sector or the private sector organization is the return on investment so we'll learn from our experts how they have their organization have dealt with this uh, roi related matters and uh, how they have convinced their uh, management to invest on uh, this data analytics so this is our plan for the entire series uh, so we will be sharing the experiences from the power distribution side generation side trading side system operation perspective and energy database related matters uh, so on the power distribution side and power trading side we are covering today where in the uh, perspective of demand forecasting supply side assessment Uh, usage of tools and case study will be shared uh, on the generation side we, we are planning to share with you the experience on renewable especially on the wind and solar forecasting and optimization side uh, on the power trading side uh, the usage of power market data and then uh, market data collection and its usage will be shared uh, on the system operation side we will be uh, seeing the market operations how it, be, it is being done how the tools are used to control the frequency Uh, the economic dispatch of electricity how it has been done there are ancillary or balance market how this the tools are being used to operate these markets will be shared and uh, uh, through the usaids initiative we have developed the south asia energy database so towards the end of this program we will also be sharing what this database is all about um, how we have done the data collection and representation 
with the help of all the regional countries and how uh, which all reports and analytical capabilities are there so these are the tentative timelines uh, so in the uh, to, uh, today we are doing for power distribution and trading subsequently we'll be having a session somewhere around mid mid of january on power generation um, uh, also in the same month or in the next month we'll be having a session on system operation followed by uh, a session from the energy database in march so uh, coming to the program uh, requesting you all to type your questions in the q and a box uh, we will be circulating the presentations to everyone and also a separate registrations will be required for all the subsequent events and we will be sending the reminders to all the registered uh, participants Uh, this is a agenda for today's event so we will be having a session a technical session one by the which will be presenting the trade power traders perspective buying and selling the power uh, as, as and in the second uh, session we will be having a session from the distribution perspective so practitioner from ptc india will be sharing the first session which is a late, leading power trader in the east, uh, south asia uh, as well as uh, the second session will be done by the bscs delhi which is a private distribution company in india after that we will be having a assessment quick assessment towards the end then we will be concluding today's session so coming to the speakers we do have uh, mr rajesh charyale chief, chief strategy officer from ptc india will be taking the first session uh, this will be followed by the another session on by uh, shovendra jha dgm bscs delhi so without taking much time now i'd request um, adya to introduce uh, our speaker rajesh ji and ask him to present thanks pramod let me just share my screen okay so in the meantime adya you can introduce him you are on mute adya sorry so just to introduce mr rajesh uh, while he is pulling up his presentation uh, he, he is the he is currently serving as the chief strategy officer at ptc india limited since uh, and has been pivotal in spearheading the crucial capital allocation projects and strategic trans his transactions within the organizations his role has extended to overseeing the operations of the data analytics department providing critical support to various internal departments and external stakeholders through the application of uh, advanced analytical methodologies including di diagnostics descriptive predictive and uh prescriptive analytics he has uh, effectively translated complex data into actionable strategies uh he has served as a managing director as nerius uh, consultants before prior to joining the ptc india so before without any further ado i would give the uh, you know stage to mr rajesh to present thank you so much mr rajesh for joining us sir uh thank you and i'll give the stage to you so thanks for the introduction i think uh, i won't take much time i think we have overshoot uh, overshot some of the time that was allocated so i'll try to keep it keep it crisp because pramod has uh, given a detail the context in any case so i would not uh, repeat whatever has been said so far and try to keep it short to live use case so a speaker before me said uh, data is more valuable than money but i would say that there is a cliched statement that data is a new oil but unlike oil which we debate about peak oil i don't think there is something called peak data so data is that valuable to make any decision in uh, any aspect any segment and all the more important in the energy space so this is how i broadly structured uh, the deck in terms of uh, setting a context which pramod has already done so i won't spend much time there in the different types of analytics that we use and some use cases of uh, data analytics in real world examples and the way forward you presented a maturity curve i think it is similar to that in terms of somebody wanted to start a fresh what is the approach that is needed to be adopted so the whole purpose of data analytics is to actually uh, get at a better decision so you can 
segment it into different approaches, uh, how to extract data, transform data, migrate, or what kind of data structures, how do you model data. But ultimately, what you want to end up uh, at is a better decision, right? So all of this is like uh, putting constructs and frameworks in place. And I'm not a big fan of sticking to a particular construct because I think all human constructs are inherently imperfect, but they can be improved upon infinitely. So this is, a, and I, from a trader's perspective, what I want to stress on is that a trader has a unique perch in the power sector. A trader actually procures electricity from the seller and also sells it to buyers. So I not only want to understand the market dynamics of the sector at any given point in time, I also want to understand what drives a generator. And I also want to understand what drives a procurer. So the analysis that a market maker like a trading licensee requires is even much more complex than either a pure generator or a procurer. So power or energy is an ecosystem business. And what this data analytics does is to help understand this ecosystem better to arrive at an informed decision. So these are like standard cliched statements like uh, what all can be done with data analytics in the power sector. The point being, if you have data, you can actually look at optimizing your generation. You can optimize your load. You can do grid analysis. Uh, you can do energy efficiency. You can do uh, market-based uh, pricing. So you can, I mean, you can data analytics is such that whatever data modeling that you engage in, you can decide what the objective function is likely to be. So if you want your objective functions to be the most economic outcome, subject to certain constraints, you can do that. If you want the objective to be the best generation to balance the load, you can set that. If you want something so that the system, the power system is reliable, you can set the objective function as that. But for each and everything, you require data. And therein lies the challenge. It was already mentioned by earlier speakers that in India, a power sector, you have 15 minute and more granular data. So one slightly nuanced variance of data is a big data. And big data has uh, an, um, utilize, has utilization uh, a lot in the power sector. How it is different from uh, regular data is more in terms of volume, velo velocity, and variety. So you cannot just handle it by traditional uh, data management techniques like standard databases, and you need specific tools. For example, like uh, I have listed here Hadoop or Spark or Kafka or RapidMiner. So these are large and complex data sets. And that is what it is going to be. And especially when you will transition to something like a machine learning or artificial based uh, programs, the ability to use these kind of uh, data sets becomes increasingly important. So as I said, that was the context. It was uh, well uh, set by the introductory speakers as well. So I'll just get into what exactly, now this is a different kind of construct on looking at analytics. For example, we primarily look at analytics in terms of these four major buckets. So one is descriptive, which is like plotting historical performance, what has happened before. As it said, history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme and it does generate insights. Then you get into diagnostic analysis, which is root cause, not, not just plotting and mapping data, but getting into what happened and why. So it might sound hubristic, but it sometimes just leads to insights and you are able to correlate, if not necessarily arrive at causation. The third is predictive, which is of extreme value in the markets of today. Starting from market prices to demands, to loads, uh, to generation, everything requires the ability to predict. And there is no getting away from it. Somebody said about the maturity curve of uh, data analytics adoption. There is a maturity curve of data analytics as well. When you end up being prescriptive, it's more about what happens in particular scenarios. Of course, you cannot uh, always model tail risks or black swan events like some glacial flood someplace or some grid getting knocked off due to some force measure. But even risk management for those tail risks can be modeled. So, all of these different segments of analysis, different types of analysis, end up supporting a rational decision that needs to be taken in particular circumstances. So that's the whole approach of the different types of data analytics. As I said, uh, I already described descriptive uh, data analytics. And it's again, I'm taking from a trader's perspective, right? It's, it's looking at historical and real-time data. 
what we do is that we plot our guarantee that we have, then we start aggregating bottom up. And then we look at what has happened in the historical performance. We try to discern seasonality, market trends, behavior of market part uh, participants. So data aggregation first, and then data mining. Again, these might be jargons, but essentially what they say is once you have plotted the data, you know, need to extract valuable information from them. So that's all that is meant by data aggregation and mining. Of course, this presumes that you have data that is available, data that is cleaned, and that is what a data scientist does, data cleaning, uh, data preparation, before actually subjecting it to analysis. So this is just an example of some data analytics it is done. Again, I'm taking you only through first order analytics, not getting into second order, third order, just to explain the concept. For example, if we were to flop, uh, plot the prices on a particular power exchange during solar and non-solar hours, solar hours being defined as 9 to 18, and then uh, you have an early morning hours between 0 to 9, and uh, uh, the evening peak between 18 to 24. So what you would observe is some uh, obvious, the obvious reasons, the solar hours, there's a lot of generation that is taking in, the, so the tariff is the least. And in the evening peaks, uh, where the generation is low, the tariffs are higher. But what is uh, interesting is the volatility during of these prices during those hours. You will observe that the volatility during solar hours is much more than the volatility during the evening peak hours. Now, this leads us to believe that why this is happening is that because, because there is a lack of supply in the evening hours, prices tend to cluster around a high value. And that is why the standard deviation is lower compared to solar hours. So if you had capacities that as a trader you had contracted and which had the ability to actually, for example, a hydro plant with a barrage or a biomass plant or something that is schedulable or even a wind plant or a plant with a storage, you would try to reserve a part of that capacity during these hours to maximize the economic returns. So that's a simple example of how a descriptive analysis can actually assess you in taking a particular decision from a trader's perspective. Now, this is a trader's internal analysis. For example, if a trader wanted to plot against other uh, market participants, other trading licenses, other market makers in terms of who is doing what in what segment cumulatively, we need to actually compile all this data. All these licenses are supposed to report data. We have data on the regulator's website. We have data at other forums, which we need to compile, clean, extract, transform. And this is simply an example of a Power BI dashboard. So this is the most elemental of data visualization. So if I wanted to uh, do an analysis of a volume wise, month wise, wise, all of that is possible by using this descriptive analysis. This also helps us to get to a particular point where to say that which trading licensee is actually doing what kind of contracts. So you can plot your competitor analysis that way. Now, this is a diagnostic analysis. As I said, this is more like root cause analysis. Why something happened? So you are trying to find causation, correlations, and why something happened and try to analyze that. Because in the future, when you want to forecast something, if such similar circumstances or similar uh, situations arise, similar variables come into play, you are able to actually take more informed uh, decisions. From a trading strategy perspective, it helps, for example, during COVID years, if we found that the volume on the exchange is shot up, it helps to pivot your business strategy, strategy to participate more on the exchanges. If in subsequent years you find that the short term market is, yeah. So this is diagnostic analysis. So mm -hmm. diagnostic analysis is, uh, I'm sorry, I, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Perfect, you are audible. So in diagnostic analysis, you are basically looking to uh, generate root cause analysis. You want to investigate the factors, right, that uh, define certain outcomes. So what you do is that once you've identified the root causes, then you are able to correlate. And in similar scenarios, you are able to implement strategies that are based on your study of the root cause analysis. Then based on a particular scenario, identifying the variables, you are able to take meaningful decisions in terms of trading strategies. This is an example of a diagnosis.
perspective so for example uh, we have this uh, deviation settlement mechanism in the linkedin grid so we are able to plot the various states against their cumulative balls and balls across the years so once you have you identify which is the state which is current uh, consistently overdrawing from the grid once you are uh, you are able to identify uh, that particular state you can go ahead and pitch to that particular state that you are consistently overdrawing and getting penalized from the grid so better i arrange some short term or long term or medium term contracts for you corresponding to that particular capacity so that you are able to maintain grid discipline better that was overdrawal this is similarly underdrawal so you can also look at a particular analysis where you can see a state which gives a schedule but is consistently underdrawing from the grid now that uh, uh, informs about improper planning so you could recommend actually either drawing less uh, submitting a schedule which is less or indicating that if the state is surplus in those uh, particular uh, years and time periods you could actually advise them on how to inject more into the grid so this is just an example of uh, diagnostic analysis now predictive, <laughs> now predictive analytics is a little more complex and it is a little more at a nascent stage because uh, every energy market is uh, more and more complex so using standard predictive tools without letting them uh, mull over or uh, study or test data over a long period of times can lead to problems and then there are unique cases which are which can never be predicted as i said the black swan event or the fat tail event, events in which case you have to look at it a different tool altogether so we use predictive analytics to actually forecast future energy prices this enables us as trading licensees or market makers to actually contract current capacity at a price where we hope to make recent, uh, decent economic returns based on our predictions on what the markets or how the markets are going to move so demand and supply is the very basic of all energy forecasts so you have to look at demand and supply predictions so again that is a, a, an essential element of all predictive analytics market risk uh, i mean that's a very very tough thing uh, to do but what you do is when you build a complex model or a forecast of uh, volumes and prices you try to factor in certain interventions especially in a highly regulated environment where there are a lot of regulatory policies in place there are always certain regulatory tailwind an example would be a renewable energy getting a waiver of transmission charges up to a defined period now if you try to model for example that that incentive or that uh, policy or regulatory tailwind goes away so what happens to the overall economics just a second ashok yeah sorry <clears throat> so that is where uh, uh, forecasting future uh, future market trends energy prices and consumer uh, demand patterns that's the core of the predictive analytics that's as traders that we do right there's another thing called asset performance forecast right uh, you i don't know many of you would have come across terms like digital twins creating uh, 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 an entire project mapping the entire asset parameters virtually and being able to do predictive maintenance forecast when you need to take maintenance etc better by using that digital twin so somebody talked about roi on investment predictive analytics is uh, i mean it's 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 a direct correlation to your roi because it will help you take decisions that would actually maximize your uh, economic benefits so this was just an example of uh, what we did with uh, uh, weighted average exchange prices on forward curve basis so this was a very simple model is just here as an illustration as uh, the uh, be all and end of predictive analytics is just to say that if you, you were to do a standard regression analysis also you will be able to forecast prices so this is just to explain the concept and based on that prices for example if you were to actually look at this 
the lowest price that is forecast is 395. So if you were to, for example, contract a power plant at three rupees or 350 and underwrite their capacity for the next 25 years, which helps them get project financing, as a market maker, you can make a decent amount of returns based on this scenario analysis. Of course, you would model different scenarios, use different tools, but essentially the principle remains the same. Now, prescriptive is a little more advanced in terms of uh, the analytical uh, analysis that you go about doing. For example, you want to find out an optimal solution to a problem uh, in a given scenario. For example, if I, I, I mentioned the case of a COVID-based scenario, where actually the generation, the demand went down and the market behavior shifted to a, a particular segment of the power market, which is the exchanges. Then there was a different scenario when demand picked up and you ended up being in deficits. The observed market behavior and trends would be different in both. So prescriptive analysis actually decides to give you decision support based on, it's, it's as, as the name suggests, it's prescriptive. But to get to that stage, to get uh, the data to be able to do that, I mean, it, it's still at a stage where human judgment and intervention is involved. We are, we are yet to come across, at least from a trading uh, uh, trader's perspective or a market maker's perspective, the tools which we can actually confidently say that provide us with prescriptive analytics for our market uh, positions and risks. So we did, for example, uh, this is a live case that we did. We created a demand forecasting model for a state. We did a bottom-up uh, demand projection using consumer categories, looked at historical CAGRs, projected what the growth would be like, projected what the state CAPEX and state GDP would be like. And then during solar and non-solar hours, uh, what was the expected generation? What kind of capacity mix would come up? And we would suggest procurement solutions for different scenarios. And accordingly, the state can then go ahead and uh, tie up capacities based on these different scenarios, what base load they want to tie up, what peak lo uh, uh, loads and supplies they want to tie up. So that is a kind of uh, the example of what a prescriptive analysis analytics would do. So that was more about the broad category. Uh, I mean, learning is uh, talked about often people mistake it uh, and use it loosely. But broadly, if I look at it, machine learning uh, algorithms are basically classified into two supervised and unsupervised learnings. Supervised learning is when you train based on certain uh, models, uh, uh, based on uh, certain models, and uh, you identify the model and try and fit the data into it. Unsupervised learning is that when there is data there and you try to discern the patterns from the data itself through techniques like categorization and clustering, but machine learning for a fact, it requires a huge, huge amount of data. In the, in the current age, when we talk about uh, generative pre-trained transformers and large language models and na natural language processing. So machine learning is assuming more and more importance. So, uh, I mean, it, there are models that have already been implemented in Europe where uh, energy prices, et cetera, are forecast using machine learning models. But in the Indian context, uh, given the unique dynamics, of the sector, we are still trying to zero down on an ML model that will help us uh, in better forecasting and predictions. As I said, these are all uh, presented to you subsequently, all, all of this natural language processing, deep learning, all of that is a part of machine learning, machine learning techniques for data analytics. <clears throat> This is a model that is uh, normally used uh, extensively. This has been used extensively by, you would find in real world uh, systems used by planners. This is also system uh, used by algorithms for price discovery where there is double-sided auctions. There is mixed integer linear programming actually uses a mix of discrete and continuous variables, right? So it is like a, a linear programming uh, module, but which has both discrete both discrete and continuous variables. Then of course, things like decision trees, as I said, this uh, presentation will be shared. Most of this is uh, their uh, techniques are easily Googleable. Uh, you could uh, look at how the uh, different models work. 
most of them are done and would fit your objectives and your data sets based on your unique requirements. Not everything will be relevant, not everything will be as effective. And just because a model is complex, need not be uh, it need not be the best solution for you. So that is something to uh, keep in mind when you look at all these different modules and tools. So these are examples of uh, already people uh, or um, uh, organizations that have tools. For example, generation optimization. Um, <coughs> then you have renewable energy integration. Uh, the Plexos energy exemplar model that is based on an MILP. The demand, res demand response and load management uh, is uh, another. Uh, so the, you have Oracle Utilities, but does this? Yes, Schneider that has a solution for it. Again, you have uh, modules for customer engagement, energy efficiency, and uh, as was earlier mentioned, for grid operations and uh, maintenance. And all of those uh, have been developed by organizations, but that does not preclude or prevent you from doing. Uh, building your own tools, but that requires in-house competency. Competency not in uh, terms just of the techniques and the tools itself, but the domain also. I think mentioned in his introduction something about a mature. If somebody was to start data analytics division today, right? So you will start with, uh, for example, First of all, first and foremost, you have to define your objectives and goals. And there has to be a clear decision maker or a leader who will drive the team, who will set the objectives, invest in training and development. This has to be a dedicated effort. The tool, uh, acquiring the tools. The person should be competent enough to handle data, uh, collect data, know everything about data analytics to actually write a dedicated team. One of the things that is very crucial for an ROI of a data analytic team is to have very clear objectives, very clear OKRs, and very clear performance indicators. And you have to start with small wins, demonstrable wins, and which actually generate insights. Because most of these divisions, when they are started afresh, require a huge amount of organizational buy-ins. The other mo uh, most important thing that you have to consider is to develop a feedback loop right? You have to continuously monitor and iterate. As I said, the most complex is not necessarily the best. Sometimes simplicity is the ultimate sophistication and it might lead you to better results. Well, that's all I had for my presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Rajiji. Uh, in fact, you are, you are on time and uh, there are a lot many questions which has come up, uh, but uh, before we take up uh, the question, just uh, one question from my side would be, uh, in the South Asia region, we do have uh, mostly the integrated entities, uh, uh, which are uh, essentially buying as well as selling power. So uh, is there a specific uh, suggestion which uh, these entities uh, can take forward? So they, they are essentially coming up to the Indian markets for buying and selling power. And uh, within their own country also, they, they do this level of trading, but every country has a different dynamic. But if there can be some suggestion uh, for these integrated entities. See, once you are integrated across the value chain, then everything becomes important in terms of plotting, right? From generation, transmission, distribution. And when you are trading into another country, then you need to understand that country's market dynamics, especially the segments that you are targeting. Right. So one of the uh, better tools that you have to consider this is from an uh, optimal portfolio management so that the entire value chain gets optimized and maximized. And because you are an integrated uh, utility, your constraints are also very clearly defined. For example, if, for example, a very crude example to take is thermal generation, you can't operate below a technical minimum. Secondly, if you have an interregional link, the link has a certain transmission capacity. You cannot go beyond that. So all of these need to be factored into a complex model. So the best part about going about doing this is once you set up a dedicated data analytic things is to start plotting data. So plot data segment wise, uh, all the segments separately, and then one unified model because the flows would happen that way. And uh, I think it is better to actually go about designing through somebody who can actually look at energy portfolio management and then advise these entities. 
Okay, and if you can unshare your screen, sir, and maybe I think switch on your camera, I think that would be more interactive. Uh, so I'll read out the questions in in the meantime. Uh, so um, I think there is one question relating to any data available for Pakistan. So uh, we do have a separate database, uh, South Asia uh, Energy Database. There, in we we capture uh, information from Pakistan. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it up to that and. Uh, uh, then uh, how frequently will the database be updated on the generation side? Uh, Rajesh, would you like to answer on this? What is the frequency of updating the database? I don't have any comment on the Pakistan angle. So we no, no, Pakistan. Pakistan, frankly. Hmm. So from a generation perspective, as I said, uh, we have, for example, our national load dispatch center, right? We have uh, generation data that comes in. We have... CA data that comes in. We have trade data in terms of CRC market monitoring reports. We have power exchange data on a 15 minute basis available the next day. So all of that data is available if somebody wanted to model it. So historical, all of that is available. Okay. So I think they are asking more from um, the, uh, okay. So these 15 minutes data on, on daily basis is available. And with that, uh, possibly they can take a decision. Okay. No, it depends, right? The 15-minute data on the power exchange is the marginal volume and marginal price. If somebody wanted to play in the uh, exchanges, that is one decision that they could take. Second, these marginal prices can give you a signal for how to trade in your short-term and bilateral contracts because very often they link it to these prices. So these are reference prices that can help you make decisions. There is no straightforward uh, answer to that. All of these markets are fragmented into these various segments, right? In India, the power exchange market is 6 to 7% of the overall market, right? So using that as a reference for your marginal volumes is a decision that you need to take. Bulk of the volume is tied up under long-term contracts. That's a different decision to take. Okay. Uh, another question is from DPDC, a distribution company uh, in Bangladesh. Uh, so he... Um, Mr. Rahman mentioned that uh, his organization is having uh, uh, is focusing on automation and remote monitoring, and they have a lot of data in the survey, uh, server, and some data are garbage and some are essential. So, would specifically would like to know out the which uh, piles of data, how to identify which data are really essential for us, reduce the time required for data analysis. So, so basically, there is a data, and from there he wanted to reach to the level wherein the, this and this can be used by them. So maybe if you can answer, uh, otherwise we do have another speaker from distribution company, he can also add during his session. So. so there are two aspects to your question. One is specific to distribution. Whenever even, even if you look at distribution data, for example, when you uh, collect data from an RMU or a distribution level feeder or a transformer, so what are you trying to collect? Uh, collect? There is current, there is voltage, there is losses, there is active power, there is reactive power, there is power factor. All of those parameters are fairly well documented. Data cleaning and data hygiene is actually the most difficult part of uh, data analytics exercises because it's grunt work. But somebody, when they plot data, identifying a, a good data scientist or a good data analyst, it's a specialized job. They, along with a domain expert, sit on that data and try to sanitize the data in terms of there will be missing data. So how do you interpolate or extrapolate? Then there will be data which are incorrect or outliers, which are incorrect data. How do you isolate? Both of that requires domain expertise as well as data science expertise. So this cannot be done simply. There is no shortcut to it. I know of fact that when we try and extract data, we take it from PDFs, we take it from images, and that part is always the most difficult. But that is all doable and if you want to seriously consider embarking on a data analytics decision, on a journey of data analytics, this exercise has to be done. And there is no cutting corners about it. Okay. Uh, I think there is another question which is relating to distribution. So I'll, uh, uh, we will take that in the next session. Um, uh, what is the minimum granularity of the data which can be used in power system analytics? Like it is worth to analyze one minute or in 10 minutes data? So uh, this question is not uh, what is the minimum granularity that is available. Data analytics is a tool which can analyze even second-based data. So when you measure frequency, that's just in cycles of second, right? It depends on what is pertinent for you in your market. 
and your utility. As I said, the key to data analytics is defining the objective function very clearly. So if you have a market in which you operate on a 15 minute basis, and that is what is relevant for you for economics and optimization, you look at 15 minute data. If you are trading in a market where a daily uh, basis or an hourly basis, it is relevant for you, it is relevant. If you look at a, a report published by the expert group or from the Ministry of Power, it says that we want to transition to a five minute data. So if you want to transition to a five minute data, then that data becomes relevant. So it is not a question of what data analytics can do. It is a question of what kind of data is available and what kind of market segments are you targeting? Okay. Another question is very specific. What uh, tools and which software PTC is using, which are the major players in providing energy analytics software? So what we are using is proprietary to us. What I can tell you is that from a normal spreadsheet to data visual visualization tool, which a Microsoft uh, allows us, we have uh, our own proprietary regression models. Uh, we also used a machine learning based model. We have dabbled with an AI based model, which is LSTM long short term memory model. So all of that we have used. Okay. And uh, uh, any major players in energy analytics software? Energy analytics. So you can uh, see most of the energy analytics is from the developed markets. So uh, you can go ahead and do it uh, from, uh, let's say, uh, somebody like an inside Be Belgium in terms of who has provided for Euphemia. You could look at uh, uh, the US markets. I listed out a few tools. The presentation will be shared for GE has some tools. Oracle has some tools. You can go to your, uh, the local consultants there. They will be help, able to outsource tools for you. But every tool, as I said, has to fit your context uh, well. Otherwise, the ROI issue will always be a cultural uh, impediment within your organization. So look at your context well, and all kinds of tools are available freely. Okay. And uh, uh, one question I think is coming from Nepal is where is the data and how and uh, who and how to access it? So essentially, the from where they can analyze Indian market uh, related data, this is one important question I think is coming. So uh, you go to NLDC, website it's published you go to crc's uh, website it is published you go to all the power exchange websites it is published so all of these data historical data you can freely get from all these uh, uh, websites of these organization from ca from crc nldc which is grid india now and uh, the individual exchanges okay then uh... Tell me about digital twin, how it will help us. So digital twin is, for example, if you had a generating plant, let's say it's a very simple case. You can do it in multiple ways. It, it helps when you have a physical asset in place and infrastructure in place. So let's say you had a wind plant and you could create a digital twin. That means you need the state of the turbine, the transformer, the oil, uh, the cable, the state of uh, uh, <clears throat> everything, the capacitor bank, uh, the turbo generator and everything. So the digital twin can help you virtually run the plant. You can simulate it in terms of when the predictive maintenance should happen. What is the peak wind season? What is the wear and tear? All of that can be plotted. It is like running the plant remotely and you have a perfect plant and you can play around with the variables. So that actually helps you in saving. It, it helps you with better o &M. It helps you with better downtime. Wind is, for example, a seasonal business and you need to maximize the uptime during peak wind season. Hello. No. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have a lot many questions. So may maybe if we can extend another five to 10 minutes, if it is possible for you. No, but, uh, Pramod, I'm already out of time. I'm exceeded my time at 10 minutes. I have to go to another presentation. Uh, so I'm sorry about okay. that. You can compile all the questions that you have. I'm happy yeah. to share them offline. Uh, okay. So what all responses are required? And I need to take your leave now. Okay. Okay. Okay, then, then uh, in, in fact, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Rajesh, sir, for uh, taking time and uh, sharing your experiences. There are a lot many questions uh, and which are relevant to the slides and relating to the market. So we will uh, uh, compile it. Take them uh, and we'll respond. Okay, and, and then we can respond to that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajesh. Sir. Over to you, Adya. So uh, uh, till the time Adya joins, uh, so I would like to thank uh, PTC India uh, for collaborating with uh, uh, Sare Hub and uh, 
also uh, rajesh uh, sir for uh, sharing uh, his experience uh, on specifically on the power markets uh, related data analytics uh, and uh, i think his the question answers uh, well were well taken and the presentation was also very useful and timely in in, in the current context adya hi yes so just so everyone uh, knows that i have switched places so you are able to see me in a very small uh, way because i've switched places in my office now uh, introducing the our second speaker by the way uh, mr sovendra jha i'll quickly introduce him he is the deputy general manager for bscs uh, rajdhani power limited in delhi managing long term and short term power demand forecasting including portfolio planning and optimizing power purchase costs he has over 11 years of experience in power sector and has extensive uh, experience in renewable thermal distribution and he is currently managing the role at PT, uh, at bses in regulatory in the regulatory aspects related to short term power purchase and scheduling long term plans Additionally, he has handled uh, uh, deviation settlement mechanisms verification. Uh, he holds BE in electrical engineering and MBA in power management. I welcome him to please uh, present his session. And over to you, Mr. Sovendra. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adya, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh... Uh, a small question in my introduction actually i am a electronics and communication engineer and not electrical engineer and i have done my mba from npti so moving on to my presentation i'll just share it Yeah, I hope my presentation is visible. Yeah, it is visible, but it's not on full screen. I have done it in full screen. I think there yeah. might be some lag. Oh, okay. We'll wait, or maybe you need to uh, do the complete screen sharing. Is it now? No, still let's in the normal mode only. Or you want me to present it? I I can also pull the presentation from here. Oh, just a second. I I'll try once again. Just. Is it in full screen now? Mm, no, I'm not able to see your screen also. Okay. Yes, yes, it is now in the full screen. Please go okay. ahead. Yeah, so. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I have shaped my presentation in such a way that it is more or less type of case study. All already, Rajesh sir, or you know, Rajesh sir has introduced lot of tools related to energy analytics and you know, big data analytics. So, starting with my presentation, basically about my company, I work in BSES Rajdhani Power Limited. We cater to approximately twenty-seven to twenty-eight lakh customers in South. and west of delhi uh, we have reached a peak load of 3390 megawatt in summers 2022 not in 2023 but in 2022 so to start with a small 
glimpse of you know indian power sector we have in financial year 2223 we have energy deficit of approximately 0.5% and a peak deficit of 4.2% and uh, going in terms of installed capacity in india we have approximately 4 lakh 20000 something of you know installed capacity in india now the indian power sector you know lot of things are changing in indian power sector either you know you can say it from the regulatory point of view either it is the renewable purchase obligation when i say renewable or purchase obligation it means how much of your input energy should come from the renewable power projects secondly the ev penetration ev has been a buzzword in indian context from last you know say 4 to 5 years and ev penetration has huge impact on any load factor of a discom secondly battery energy storage system although due to cost dynamics and all discoms might not be perceiving it as a you know active thing but the regulatory point of view there are a lot of regulations which has come up and it mandates a discom to put up either battery energy storage system or some distributed energy resource then penetration of solar rooftop then many innovative base you know innovative things by the you know persons who are into power pilferage and secondly and lastly but most important nowadays customer demands lot of analytics for their energy consumption how much energy i am using into heating appliances how much energy i am using into you know my ev or something like that lot of analytics the customer wants nowadays so the power dynamics in india is changing now use of data analytics in distribution sector so this is the most important slide as i work in distribution company so basically 80 to 85% cost of a distribution company is for the power purchase cost so optimizing the power purchase cost is one of the most important thing we in a power distribution company need to do so how does it starts overall as sir has already said 24 hours of each day is divided into 96 time slots of 15 minute each then we have to do day ahead demand forecasting then we have to assess source wise from which power plant which we will be scheduling how much power then we have there is a concept called as merit order dispatch it is nothing but a bucket filling approach wherein you have to schedule maximum from the least cost plant and you have to schedule minimum from the maximum rate plant which has the maximum rate or the variable cost then sale or purchase of you know on a day ahead basis and intra day basis and then intra day scheduling including bids in real time market so any drawl from the grid minus the schedule of the discom say for example if my drawl from the grid is 2000 megawatt but i am i my schedule is 1950 megawatt so that 50 the 50 megawatt will go under the unscheduled interchange and it is related to frequency and it has a separate rate which i will be discussing in my later part of the presentation so how does demand forecasting works these are the inputs of a demand forecasting like you need to have the historical load of past years the more number of years you have the historical load the more will be easier for the machine to run the model to learn to you know run various test cases the weather parameters historical weather patterns also need to be there seasonality seasonality should be there like whether it it was on that day but it was summer season winter season or some rainy season something like that holidays where there was some you know long weekends there some cricket match was there or some disturbances like covid 19 or something like that then final the algorithm which we choose for do to do the demand forecasting better the demand forecasting more optimized will be the power purchase cost now process as i told you historical load pattern weather pattern is required then the tools which we use to start with initially we used to use the excel based tools or the some regression tool but that was all excel based tools 
now came in the artificial intelligence machine learning or supervised learning we used to train the model like in a particular set of temperature in a particular set of you know whether it is a working day or off day how did the load behaved in the previous year or the past day and accordingly the machine learned like what will be the next course of action or what will be the next forecast so this is basically you know how does basically the demand forecasting works the load data temperature data weather variations these all comes as an input energy then you need to dwell on the data exploration and then you need to have the proper algorithm and final predictions is the output now this is the most important slide as i told you like my presentation is more of a case study type of thing so basically when i say weather data say for example now it is say for example it is a summer season and say for example today is 45 degrees celsius and my load today is say for example 3000 megawatt so it is not necessary tomorrow also on a 45 degree celsius my load will be 3000 megawatt there are lot of parameters which impacts my load for example in this you can see the this is a meteorogram product which is by the indian meteorological department developed by indian meteorological department we use this product for our day ahead demand forecasting wherein this product gives me the anticipated rainfall how much rainfall is predicted for tomorrow what will be the level of clouds whether these are the low clouds middle clouds high clouds secondly what will be the temperature predicted for tomorrow relative humidity humidity plays a very important role when i talk in terms of you know whether it is uh, summer season or winter season but basically humidity plays a very vital role in summer season then the thunderstorm predictions for next day whether there will be thunderstorms or not this meteorom tool also help me for to tie up if i want to tie up a power if a trader is offering me or if a power exchange or something if a, you know generator is offering me a power for say next week say for example for next week i am giving you a power for this much rupees so by using this product of you know meteorogram i can analyze whether i need to procure additional power from a trader or a generator or a power exchange reason being the weather in the next week whether the temperature will be on a lower side or on a higher say for example on this date here if my screen is visible to you on this date the temperature curve is on a very lower side so i so my demand will be on a lesser side and hence no need to procure any additional power now coming on to the next slide this is basically a radar imagery again developed by the indian meteorological department wherein this tool is used on a intraday scheduling wherein say for example if in afternoon 3 o'clock i am at the scheduling desk and if some patch of clouds is there i need to see whether it is coming towards delhi or it is going outside delhi so the radar imagery also helps in you know giving me the extent of clouds the direction of cloud so the question arises here what will be i will be doing once i know the extent of the cloud or the direction of a cloud say for example in as per indian electricity grid code i can give revision to any plant i can either ramp up a plant or ramp down a plant only after 7 or eight slots it means either after one and a half hours or more than that so by looking at this radar imagery or the direction of the cloud i can in intraday or in the present day i can give a ramp down decision okay in the coming hours my demand will be on a lower side because of the rain hitting in my distribution area so i can ramp down my schedule from various plants thus saving on my variable cost from those plants so this slide i have put on to show that demand forecasting is not basically just a compounded annual growth rate predictions lot of things come into demand forecasting because as you can see from the graph over here on a year on year basis the growth is not symmetrical or the or there in many years you can see there is no growth it is lesser than the previous year this was the covid year 
but again in the in this in this year in financial year 23 24 also you can see the growth is lesser than the previous year reason being because there are I mean the climatic conditions the you know the climatic condition or some special conditions or there might be some load shift so these all things cannot be just forecasted on a simple CAGR growth model. So we need an artificial intelligence tool to, you know, forecast our either long-term forecast or short-term forecast or day-head forecast. Now, this is a typical summer and winter load curve for BSES Rajdhani. As you can see, uh, in summers, we touch the peak load both during the night time, day time, and again the night time. And in winters, it is the opposite. The peak load is touched during like 8 to 10 hours in the morning. My next slide will clearly show this difference. You can see there is a variation of approximately 2500 megawatt uh, between the load curve of, you know, summers and winters. Say for example, and that too, it is complete opposite of what the demand is on a summer and on what the demand looks like on a winter. So why I have kept this slide to, you know, the importance of this slide will be in my next slide where when we are going to do our portfolio optimization or, you know, portfolio planning, how much, you know, power I need to tie up because once you are, you have entered a power purchase agreement, you cannot come out of a power purchase agreement, say in a one year or six months, something like that. So you need to have a very clear look of the load profile of your distribution company. So if you are, say for example, and also in a day also, say for example, you are giving reserve shutdown to a plant. You cannot ask a thermal power plant to go for reserve shutdown when in, during winter season, you don't have any demand. And again, during the geyser load, because in winters, this is the geyser load period. Again, in the morning time, when you have geyser load, you cannot say thermal generating company, okay, now come on, you know, on, on bar, come on bar and then give me electricity. So these things need to be kept in mind while, you know, deciding on the, our power portfolio profile. So this is a typical, you know, how does load varies in a day? It is an example of 8th June and 9th June. Both were hot and humid day. As you can see, the load was more or less similar. But again, the rain hit at approximately 17 hours. And you can see there is a huge drop in demand. The demand in the previous day was approximately 2700. But since the rain hit at this time, the demand dropped as low as 2177 to 1290 megawatt. So this type of, you know, things, this type of variations in the demand in intraday need to be taken very wisely by the person who is sitting at the scheduling desk of a distribution company. Reason being by looking at the pattern of the demand of the previous day, say, for example, the scheduling desk operator might be keeping his schedule from various plants in the range of 25, 2400 in this case. But as I have said in my earlier slide, by the help of radar imagery, by the help of radar imagery implemented on the AI ML tools, we can know what will be the direction of the cloud as well as how much rainfall, how much rainfall by this bar, how much uh, rainfall this rain bearing clouds will be powering on over Delhi. So what actually my scheduling disk operator should do, they need to ramp down the schedule from various plants in order to optimize any underdraw to the grid. This things we in BSES Rajdhani, we have done it and uh, Osoko, Power System Operator of India and IMD, they have jointly published a report wherein they have taken few, uh, you know, case of BRPL and they have cited our example wherein we were able to save approximately 1.5 crores in terms of ramping down our power plant by using the help of radar. 
now key challenges the data availability unavailability say for example when i talk of demand forecasting demand forecasting also requires the met demand as well as some load loss due to any plant shutdown or any unplanned shutdown or whatsoever so the record of all the you know load loss should be there then data unavailability when i am a beginner i will be doing demand forecasting on a system level say for example bses rajdhani i will be doing demand forecasting on a system level uh, level but when i will be you know going more you know maturing towards demand forecasting i will be doing demand forecasting on a feeder level basis wherein which are the major feeder which are the major load feeders of my you know distribution company i need to forecast based on the feeder this feeder will be affected or this feeder has gone for a unplanned shutdown or a planned shutdown so the load from this feeder will be on a lower side something like that so these type of things will be on a more matured level of demand forecasting but in a discom it is not necessary that data is the load data is maintained on a feeder level basis or even on a system i have come across many discoms where they call me and tell me that they don't also don't have proper you know their load demand on a system level basis for last you know 5 year 10 year 15 year something like that then data accuracy data accuracy is also important otherwise garbage in garbage out so the more the accurate data will be there the more the accurate forecasting results will be there then data gaps there might be data will be available but uh, accurate data will be available but there might be some data gaps say for example in a year there might there might be 5 or 10 days where the load data will not be available or there might be some days where the weather data will be not there or some wind speed data will not be there or some you know rainfall data might not be available these all data gaps are is one of the challenge of you know achieving a proper demand you know a proper for achieving a proper forecasting tool to from output from a proper forecasting tool now which model to use so if suppose i have implemented a ai ml tool in my organization so in if i take the example of demand forecasting which model i need to choose say for example do i need to give more weightage to the temperature curve do i need to give more weightage towards the humidity pattern whether i need to give more weightage towards the rainfall pattern or something like that so which model or which algorithm you need you need to choose is also a, one of the key challenges in you know using of ai ml now thirdly and uh, lastly is the resistance to change many a times as i told you earlier many a majority of the things are done on excel based so the desk operator or the person who is into the forecasting or into the power planning they might be having a sense okay my excel based tool is giving me a proper uh, result so why need to go for a ai ml tools the answer lies here is that as a excel based tool or any you know manually things done there is a limitation of excel there is a limitation of manual you know analysis but the moment we implement ai ml in our organization we need to understand that ai ml is a marathon we have to slowly win that marathon and it is not a sprint okay i have implemented ai ml in my organization from tomorrow i need to have 100% accurate demand forecast no it is not like that so we need to have this mindset while implemented implementing ai ml in our organization now the second part uh, after demand forecasting here comes the planning so there are various type of you know portfolio planning or you can say the availability planning by a discom long term planning wherein i go and sign a ppa for say for term 25 years then seasonal planning what will be my next summers how will be my availability in the next summers or winters then month ahead planning your finance your you know finance team say for example i need to buy electricity of approximately 200 crores or 150 crores in the next month so my finance team or the accounts team they also need to have a proper cash flow in hand okay so for that month ahead planning is required 
then day ahead planning is required and then intraday planning. Now, the various important factors while you know going towards our portfolio planning is one of the most important is load curve. And basically more important is the load duration curve. For example, what is how for how much time is your peak load coming? The base the base load, say so in our in our case, I have cited example of you know summer of 19, 21, and 22. So here you can see 2000 megawatt, it has come to approximately in financial year, in the summer of 19, it has approximately 2200 hours. In, in summers of 22, approximately 2600 hours. Now 3000 megawatt has come just for 12.5 hours uh, in summers 2019 and for 78 hours for summers 2022. Now Delhi, as a discount of Delhi, we come under universal supply obligation where we cannot, you know, disconnect any load, citing examples of non-availability of power. We are a universal supply obligation entity wherein we have to supply 24 bar 7 electricity to all our customers. So when we do a proper planning for catering to our customer, I cannot go on and sign PP of approximately 3000 megawatt by saying that, okay, 12, I need to cater to this 12.5 uh, hours of electricity demand to my customers. So my PPA capacity, capacity should be 3000 megawatt. Secondly, the duration of the load, as I have showed you in my previous slide, that you, with this summers and winter slide, whether, where is your peak coming? During the summers, your peak is coming in the night time as well as daytime. In daytime, you will be supported by solar, the solar portfolio, the solar generation in your portfolio. But in night time, those all solar portfolio generation will be gone from your portfolio. So how you will be managing your night peak? Similarly, during winters, winters here, solar will help you. But solar is a combination of solar and thermal. But what will we, you do of the thermal generation? when you don't have any load like or negligible load during the night hours of winter. So what you will be doing with that load because their loss of sale, say for example, a thermal power plant might be having an ECR of 4 rupees or 4.5 rupees. But here the prices which you will be getting in exchange, even after backing down all the thermal capacity, the prices which you will be getting in exchange might be 2, 2.5 rupees. So how you will manage your loss on sale over here? So these all questions need to be answered while we do portfolio optimization planning. Secondly, uh, yeah, I was in the load curve slide. So basically we need to understand what is my base load, base load which comes approximately 80% of the time. What is my peak load which is less than 20% of the time? And what is my intermediate load? which is between the peak load, uh, the peak load and the base load. So basically I need to, when I go for my signing any PPA or doing any medium term contract of say five, seven years or any monthly contract, I need to understand what is my load scenario. Like how does my load duration curve behaves? Now the resource advocacy ministry of power in India, they have defined various, you know, uh, resource advocacy target wherein you have to have minimum long term of say approximately 75 to 80 percent in your portfolio medium term contracts you we can have 10 to 20 percent and remaining through short term by 10 to 20 percent then rpo targets has been defined by government of india say for it ranges from 30 percent to 43 percent in financial year 30 wherein an interesting fit to be noted down here is the distributed energy renewable energy so this has also been mandated by government of india where a distribution company need to have the distributed renewable energy resource in their portfolio and here comes the requirement of either battery energy storage system or you know standalone solar system something like that then short term these are the you know, various products 
which you need which you need in a distribution company to finalize on your portfolio planning say for example to start with banking say for example i am a discom wherein my demand shoots up in the summer season so i will be taking power from a different state who has hydro assets in their portfolio and they don't and they don't have so much of peaking requirement or they don't have much of energy requirement during the summer season so i will be signing a contract with that state that okay i will take power from you during the summer season and i will be returning back you the power during the winter season where you will be requiring for heating load and also the uh, you know hydro plants they might not be generating to their maximum during winters so i will be providing back the that power during the winter this don't involve any cash transactions so this is called banking so while arriving at a banking how much banking i need to do from a discom perspective whether i will be able to return that banked power during my winter season or not so these all things need to be considered and this can be done only if i have a proper demand forecasting if i have a proper demand forecasting or a then i will be knowing okay this much availability is in my kitty i can be able to cater my demand and again i will be able to cater my banking export during winters through my available resources now secondly bilateral and long duration contracts uh, as i have told you nowadays power market all over the world and precisely in india has become very dynamic any outage in any part of india any outage in any part of india it you know changes the whole price market scenario of you know power market so accordingly if i am a discom and if i want to do a bilateral contract to meet my power duration require you know to read to meet my power requirement i would like to enter in a bilateral contract or a long duration contract available through power exchanges in bilateral contract generally since it is for the peak duration it is for the peak season so generally the rates available in bilateral contracts might not at par with your long term portfolio so you need to have a very clear thought process and a very clear ai ml model wherein you are forecasting your demand perfectly so that you are not in a situation where either you have over purchased on a higher rate or you have purchased less which in turn will lead to unavailability of power when the peak season comes and you will be forced to buy from the short term market on a very higher rate accordingly the day ahead market the day ahead forecast need to be intact and well in place because as i said you the more better the forecast the more better will be your power purchase planning and accordingly the optimization of power purchase cost and last the real time market in india we have a real time market wherein we can purchase power in intraday which will be scheduled after the fourth time slot in which you have after the five fifth slot in which you have purchased the power say for example if i am buying power at 10:45 to 11 i will be delivered that power from 12 to 12:30 it is in a half half hourly market real time market so the more accurate my demand forecast will be there the best use of my real time market i can take in terms of if the prices in real time market or you know any segment is higher i can sell off my excess capacity or if the prices are on a lower side in real time market or day hand market i can back down my portfolio the you know schedulable plants i can back down my schedulable plants and i can procure through the market now these all also some use cases of discoms where in uh the discoms use ai ml tools for you know loss identification which all feeders are more lo losses prone wherein they can either by changing the transformer or something modification to the transformer tapping can be done wherein losses can be reduced then as i said you distributed energy resources 
setting up distributed energy resource definitely consumes the you know definitely consumes cost and also requires lot of study where that that remote grid is able to take that distributed energy resource or not so as a discom point of view the more accurate demand forecasting the more accurate will be the use case of distributed energy resource then way forward how can a discom you know be you know at a benefit by using the artificial intelligence and ai ml tools like integration of databases as a discom you will start integrating your database wherein you can be keeping your the met demand the load loss demand or you can say the unrestricted demand then by use of ai ml tools you can have the trends visualization what which will help you in more better decision making better forecasting leading to better optimized power purchase cost long term planning taking into consideration the regulatory requirement of so whether you need to sign go into a pp of 25 years or you need to go into a short term contract you know medium term contract of 7 years or a short term contract of 1 month then reduced operational costs definitely automating the manual thing or the statistic driven things you can definitely reduce on the operational cost and then customer delight better product offering demand response time of day tariff so by better demand forecasting or i would say the better you know price forecasting in bscs what we have done we have a small battery energy storage system wherein you can see this blue lining this was the energy used for the charging and you can see correspondingly the rtm real time market rates so where where the real time market rates were on a lower side we charge the battery and we discharge the battery where the rates were on a higher side in real time market so this battery operated in two cycles again during the day time the real time market prices were on a lower side and during the evening hours evening lighting load hours the we have done the battery discharging similarly these are for i have kept for few other days that's all my from my side thank you so much now i am open for answering the questions yes uh, thank you uh, shubhin ji in fact uh, very interesting uh, discussion and your uh, one specific aspect which at least i uh, learned is on the uh, radar imaginary usage and how bscs has uh, essentially used that to uh, forecast so there are lot many questions so i'll start uh, reading them and uh, maybe yeah, sure. take time uh, so uh, i think i'll start from the downside this time uh, so uh, how can energy data analytics help our customers so any experience you would like to share so definitely energy analytics data as i was uh, i forgot to mention something called as time of day tariff regime wherein you will be charged on a higher slab rate when you are using your electricity on a you know peak time and you will be charged on a nominal rate when you are using your electricity on a off peak so what is the use of energy analytics on a customer point of view the question is that so when time of day tariff regime is being introduced in that particular segment or in that particular country so what will happen is that being a customer i will be knowing okay these all are my you know these all are my you know consumption habits i am using this much of you know units for my heating requirement this much of my units for ev charging requirement this much of for you know ac requirement something like that so the non essential load i can shift to the off peak hour and accordingly i can you know optimize my energy bill okay so uh, again a related question is whether tod tariff should be implemented for domestic customers in order to flatten the curve or it should be for the larger customer base so basically as as i said you uh, i will talk of my perspective in bscs we have we are more of a domestic cons, you know consumer base so definitely time of day tariff regime 
is essential to you know flatten the curve because the non essential load definitely can be you know shifted to the off peak hour all right uh, does the load curve have some uncertainties could be during base and or peak load how do you deal with it what are the marginal uncertainties during the differential load so basically yeah when i talk of base load definitely every year uh, when you will be plotting the load duration curve or the load curve definitely the base load for each year will be different but on a distribution company perspective when you go for a base load analysis or a base load uh, you know load curve analytics you do you do this load curve analysis for you know shaping your power portfolio it is not like that say for example the covid year the base load was on a lower side so based based on that i will not be going in entering a ppa for 25 years so for the base load i will be considering the base load of past few years then what is the trend of the that base load how it is increasing or you know keeping stable and all and accordingly as a distribution company i need to go on for my optimizing my power portfolio so accordingly on a changing base load it will not have much impact because year on year definitely the base load will be changing all right okay another question i think there are many questions which are coming from bangladesh side is on the data related matter so there are different sets of formats are available in different forms and uh, they need to combine it combine it and then analyze it so on any uh, uh, suggestion how this uh, data can be sanitized compiled and used uh, maybe any experiences which uh, bscs can share yeah definitely as, as as i have shown two pictures of you know one was of radar imagery and one was of meteorogram so basically that is a pictorial set of data wherein you need to find out what is the you know in millimeters what will be the rainfall or in what in you know what will be the humidity and all so definitely in ai ml there are tools which are able to capture data in different formats either it is a image format either it is a graph format and then the proper you know the input data which is required from those pictures or those you know texts that can be extracted and that goes as a input into the ai model definitely there are tools available okay. uh, one question is what percentage of revenue spent on data extraction uh, and analysis so if you have any numbers in mind or any in analytics what could be the possible spend like for example 1% half percent or such figure I, is there presently i cannot comment on that you know percentage but i i would say uh, in a distribution company that is a very nominal amount in terms of as i told you the i have specifically kept a slide on 80 to 85% of a distribution company the cost is of power purchase cost so when you think that you need to derive uh, the benefits of ai and ml then i think it will be a very meager amount hmm. Correct. So, so basically, there are multiple benefits which we have seen throughout yes. the session on operation, maintenance, uh, power purchase cost, exactly, uh, uh, operational efficiency. So, so I, I think this cost aspect is something uh, which 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 is something the organization can take a very easily a call and regulators possibly will be uh, happily to uh, agree yeah. to this the, proposal. Yeah. The starting point should be to start, you know, integrating your database to. start maintaining your database either it is a feeder level thing or either it is a system level thing or a grid level thing like hmm. today is the start point say for example you start integrating the database everything yes i i even remember from my earlier days also when uh, the private companies in delhi distribution delhi took over and then there was a similar set of information they started implementing different solution right. and after 3 to 4 years they found a problem with a lot of data having a different issues and in 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 at least in uh, my previous experience i have seen that they have found one or two base uh, system for example the erp system or the gis system wherein all the data is integrated and then it is being used by 
different uh, operating uh, department right. um, yeah uh, um, another question is who is responsible to provide the data i think this i think has been covered in our earlier session the system operators provide data the ca yeah exactly in terms of you know load and all the system operators will be providing your data and uh, in terms of power portfolio or like your ppa data or like what is the you know tariff of your variable cost of your ppa plant or something like that the power procurement cell or the pmg cell you call it they will be responsible to be more hmm. precise Yes, and and the exchange data is all, all already publicly available. Uh, yes, the regulatory well, data. Well. Is, yeah, many many of these things are publicly also very easily available. But these need to be compiled, taken into the format, and then used. Right. Uh, what are the tools used to convert metrological parameters to final demand prediction in intraday scheduling in fifteen minutes? Simple Excel tool are not effective. Any integration tool available? as i told you like in bscs rajdhani we have uh, you know deployed ai ml and we are also taking the service of various vendors where we we have onboarded various you know the uh, vendors who are giving us ai and ml solutions uh, so what in intraday forecasting the accuracy need to be for the next 6th 7th 8th slot something like that after the introduction of real time market in india as i said you from the fifth slot you will be able to purchase or sell power in the power exchange in real time market so when i talk in terms of accuracy on a winter season in in to start with winter season in winter season accuracy the ai ml model will give more weightage to the previous day demand or the and the weather pattern and in summer season the ai ml tool will give more importance to the temperature as well as humidity level correlated with the previous day demand so to be more accurate in a intraday forecasting the ai ml the weightage need to be changed whether the weightage is more on the humidity side in a summer season or the temperature side in a summer season or the wind speed something like that okay is there a factor of demand drop to severity of rainfall so demand drop is in correlation to uh, rainfall is there a specific De definitely definitely there is but as i have showed you for example i have showed you a picture of radar in my presentation so that patch of cloud will bear how much millimeter of rainfall exact how much millimeter of rainfall no one can predict to be more, it can be up to a range so if the answer is okay how much millimeter of rainfall will drop how much megawatt of demand there is no straight answer for that there is no straight answer because it also depend what is the trend of your demand in the previous slots say for example at 12 noon your demand is 2000 megawatt and rainfall happens at 15 hours in the day that drop will be different to the demand if suppose you are having 2500 demand at 12 noon and rainfall happens in 15 hours so this is always you know more of a relative type of thing in what demand was having you know you were having in the previous slots uh, what are the barriers for utilities to forecast with minimum error means how 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 the what are the issues with the distribution companies uh, to better forecast so i would say this is very good question the thing is that in a distribution company the hindrance or you know the bottleneck for doing a proper demand forecasting or to not able to achieve to the desired result is the availability of accurate data and when when i said data it is basically weather data i can tell you you go to there are various private websites which offer you the actual weather data on a free basis you go to a different private weather sources different weather sources will be having different actual temperature of yesterday one weather website will be showing the maximum temperature as 26 degree one will be showing 25 degree or 24 degree something like that so availability of accurate weather data is one of the challenges to attain better demand forecasting i would say 
okay uh, what happens when uh, we draw 200 megawatts uh, and contracted for 2100 megawatt as per our prediction do we need to pay based on contracted power or actual drawn power no basically like this question is more in terms of scheduling say for example if you have scheduled 2100 megawatt if i understand the question rightly if you have scheduled for 2100 megawatt but in the coming slot, if you have dropped, uh, but your demand has dropped by 200 megawatt. The question is Correct. that. Correct. So you, we need to pay for whole 2100 megawatt because that is the amount of power we have scheduled either from my PPA plants, either through power exchange, either through my bilateral contract, something like that. So I need to pay for those all 2100 megawatt. Okay. Um... Another question is, how do you deal with model uh, uncertainties? Uh, what would they be your cost to deal with the model uncertainty? So definitely, as I told you, we have deployed various vendors which are giving us AIML solutions. What happens is that when while interacting with them, they say that they do not use a particular model for throughout the year. Say, for example, a model might be giving good results on peak summer day that model is not good that model doesn't give you know the desired output on a winter season or a volatile day so these ai ml service providers they use ensemble models wherein they keep model 1 model 2 model 3 n number of models they keep on live by giving the same input data and they change the weightage of different parameters which goes into the input and then finally through an ensemble model they give us a final output okay. another question is is covid year data considered in forecasting or still excluded as it was an exceptional year so i think uh, he yeah it straight answer is excluded yeah excluded uh, yeah. how do you allow grid integration or, uh, for rooftop solar so these data also you gather it uh, for forecasting generation supply side or demand assessment the again a very good again a very good question uh, like uh, as and when you know more and more customers are going into for net metering and you know solar rooftop definitely during the summers as i have shown you the graph uh, the peak of the day peak of uh, you know BSES Rajdhani comes at the same time when the solar also peaks. So definitely it will have my peak shaving. But since the installed capacity in BSE and BSES discom uh, is, uh, you know, the output of that, you know, installed capacity, we are taking into consideration. But that integration presently we are not doing, but on a you know going on a further stage we need to do that integration with our peak shaving because definitely that will have an impact on our peak shaving also the amount of output generated from the net metering definitely our peak will be shaved during the daytime okay um one is uh, is there any online training course for data driven economics is that relevant for south asian market so uh, in fact, just to add to this, uh, through SAREP program, we do a lot of uh, trainings and uh, these are based on the specific feedback which we receive from all the stakeholders. So uh, uh, in case if there is a need to have a, a specific uh, training on energy economics, I would request you to give uh, your uh, requirements in the feedback and we'll try to uh, cover that as a part of webinar or any physical event which we are doing. So there are a lot many activities which we are doing uh, as a part of uh, the COS AIDS initiative and uh, many of these things will be available to all the stakeholders. Okay, I think rest all were relating to PTC. Mm, one of the biggest challenges data analysis is, uh, is ensuring the quality of data. Again, this is on the data quality. Um, how do you analyze data for new connection at distribution level? Typically at the gen, uh, typically at generation level. Okay, I don't know means new connection factoring for the generation planning. Uh, this is I think something which is uh, having a question. BSES do not have any you know generation of its own. Okay, no. So on demand estimation, the new connections uh, yeah. which are coming in. Yeah. Yeah. So our as again as I said you, you know. 
if i will see it at a macro level so as i said you for a system point of view bscs we will be doing a demand forecasting ki okay my you know what does my demand forecast say whether i will be uh, my demand will be increasing from this year or not so definitely if my demand is increasing or say the forecast has given me a 2% increase or a 3% increase definitely it will also include the new connections because as i said earlier 80% of my load is from the domestic consumers only okay yeah how, how block bid impact the exchange's price prices block bid is impacting the price means uh, how the block bid is having an uh, impact on exchange price this is the sir so, so basically the thing is that in block bid the simple answer is that either your bid will be accepted or your bid will be rejected so if you uh, the uh, to be precise is that say for example if you are a seller if you are a seller and you are putting the block bid of sale sale bid and you are having a large portfolio and you have placed the block bid on a low, on a lower rate so if your bid is selected if the block bid is selected then definitely the prices of the exchange will drop because since you were the you know higher you or you were the you know majority seller and you have placed the block bid on a lower price say for example i am giving a vague example a uh, vice versa will be the case say for example if the if you have placed a block bid on a higher rate and if your bid is selected definitely you will you know increase the prices on the exchange okay one last question is uh, relating to uh, the market price determination so is there anything which uh, you do on uh, price uh, forecasting definitely we are uh, taking the service of one of our vendors uh, for day ahead price forecast but the thing is that in during my presentation i have told you nowadays power markets have become very dynamic say for example in rtm if the rates were in the range of 3 rupees and suddenly a generator in the south of 1000 megawatt has stripped there's two units of a 500 megawatts of that plant has stripped or something like that so the prices will go go sharply from 3 rupees to 6 rupees or you never know from 6 to 10 also so the you know we are and definitely price forecasting is done by us but the thing is that due to the uh, imbalance imbalance of demand and supply or you know very dynamic nature of power markets or the supply definitely sometimes for sometimes the price forecast also goes for it us okay uh, so we do have our sarep expert also uh, victor uh, so uh, bhumika or adya maybe if you can also just uh, upgrade him to the speaker slot i'll like to give him at least 2 minutes to uh, uh, speak uh, Can you upgrade, yeah. Victor? Yeah, yeah. Let me do that. Victor Vanya, right? Yes. Yeah, just a second. Shwanji, we will just take two minutes since he also is having. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Experiences. Yeah. So yeah, he's been upgraded, so he'll be joining any time now. Yeah. So Victor ji, are you able to hear me? Yeah, yeah. Hi. Yeah, so, <laughs> so uh, thank you for joining. And uh, just uh, I think uh, you might have also seen the questions which are coming around is on uh, data uh, sanitization part and collection part, and then uh, model development related uh, issues. Uh, I think these are the basic uh, issues which uh, everyone is uh, facing. Uh, and then the predictability part of it, uh, how the model is basically improved uh, in in years. So maybe if you would like to. uh could you explain to the uh, uh, everyone uh, your experience on this yeah uh so in terms of uh, data cleaning is concerned uh, uh, usually uh, it's all uh, comes with experience as i think shoyan ji has said so with experience working with data and we find out various ways to uh, filter out and fill the data and identify the missing data and all and then we pair it with Uh, uh some statistical sometimes we use ai based tools and all because let's say we are talking about scada data so we may see that a lot of data goes missing 
but we have to rely on that for using our re real time uh, predictions and all there what we uh, do is we again uh, we develop again uh, for every discom we have to have a new strategy of data cleaning because uh, the kind of errors they have and the kind of deviations we observe in data are all different for each discom and we identify the patterns and then we incorporate some machine learning based capabilities sometimes we at basic level we do statistical use statistical models and uh, there are techniques uh, also in data science there are uh, various techniques how we can uh, identify and filter the data and how uh, how we can uh, clean it on real time basis also and sometimes at uh, if, if some errors are uh, data issues are too complex then we go to machine learning based tools and uh, uh, that's again uh, on the data cleaning part, but uh, the biggest task and biggest uh, effort on most of the data analytics uh, uh, services in the power sector goes uh, 60 to 70 percent of uh, our time or analyst time, data scientist time goes into data cleaning and then uh, uh, arranging the data, collecting the data and cleaning the data. And that's the most challenging part in the power sector. Hmm? All right. And, All right. Model modeling part. If you want to uh, share your experience, since you also are there in the business and have uh, developed uh, several models, so how that has evolved and where exactly the model lies and how it is improving, and maybe what do you foresee a future also? Maybe uh, after two, uh, three years. Uh, you mean in terms of uh, uh, demand maturity? Mat yeah, maturity of the model and the uh, accuracy of the price forecast, demand forecast. Yeah, uh, see, most of the challenges we face, even on the analytical side globally also, it, it it's with the data part, not with the models, actually. So there are a lot of sophisticated mo models across the globe. Uh, and we are also, in, in India, India also, there are a lot of players who are capable enough to deploy those tools. But the challenge comes with uh, having the right set of data and uh, uh, and, and also that data should be available when we are doing the forecast, not that uh, the time is lapsed and then we have some delayed data, one, one day they had or one week delayed data, so it doesn't help. And having reliable data is the biggest challenge in power sector across almost all the discoms. And the second aspect comes with key, you have the tool, you have the data, and then how do you connect both of them? How you... Um, model the tools or how you uh, what kind of parameters you take and how uh, what is the uh, modeling we do and let's say we experience for example in in a discom we experience some abrupt drop in loads and then we may uh, again the whoever is deploying those kind of demand forecasting tool they have to identify whether it is weather related or there are some abnormal uh, things which he is not able to understand based on the variables we are considering. Are there some uh, outages at distribution network? Or if there are not outages, is it the uh, missing data issue? Or uh, also if sometimes there are some behavioral aspects also, or sometimes what happens is that okay, there are local decisions made at feeder level or district level or area level by some local government or authorities. Or, or or some other uh, localized festivals or some other aspects may be coming. So all these things, uh, whoever is working on the, such assignments, that analyst should be uh, able to understand. And then once they are able to identify the issues, they should be able to model them. If they don't have the capability to model them, and that's, again, uh, the model cannot be improvised. And then we cannot factor in those kind of variables into the model. And that becomes very challenging because it, it uh, it involves a mix of expertise on the demand side or the distribution side and also the expertise on the data side. So mixing both of them is the bigger challenge. And uh, the more time we spend on any assignment or the demand forecasting of any state or utility, and the more learnings come in and then with time we keep improvising, adding more variables, more parameters and taking care of many uncertainties. And, and it's an evolving process. And uh, I think uh, demand forecasting as such as a research engagement it's been evolving from the last 60 70 years so it's still being done a lot of research is being done but uh, as we said the bigger problem is on the data and then how to model that data and these these are the challenges we face
Okay. One last question is on the South Asian context. Since now you do have a some exposure on the regional countries also, especially Nepal and Bhutan. So, any learnings which you would like to share with the other uh, regional countries uh, from uh, this uh, from the preparedness perspective? Yeah, if you look at the regional countries uh, uh, again. Uh, data is uh, the problem of data becomes more complicated here uh, because in India utilities we have uh, uh, been uh, adopting technology and the transformation has been uh, taking place from the last eight to ten years and then we are in a fairly mature state uh, in India maybe from 15 17 onwards we are we have been adopting a lot of tools analytics and all and and there are uh, pretty much standardized and people now have every state or a discom has some a good set of data or, or some reasonable set of data. But when we are talking about countries which are still uh, developing and again uh, have, are in the mode of uh, transitioning or improving their adopting the technology. So they have challenges with respect to data collection itself. And then uh, uh, maintaining the data quality and reliability becomes a bigger problem. So the basic fuel, as you say, oil is something is missing in most of the countries when we are talking about Bhutan and Nepal or even to some extent Bangladesh also. And, and those are the challenges we have to deal with. So when we have a lot of uh, uh, data discrepancies and data issues, uh, again, dealing with those kind of challenges becomes the bigger problem and 80 to 90 percent of the problem solving or uh, uh, I can say effort goes into those things. and. I think uh, uh, it's again a long way to uh, come up with. Again, uh, with time, these things will be resolved. And uh, I think they're on course to improvement there. Thank you. Thank you, Vinay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, in fact, uh, uh, now we are concluding this session. And uh, overall, the two sessions were very informative in terms of uh, strategic level, getting a basic uh, information uh, uh, to to a maturity level and uh, we will be sharing all these presentations with you uh, we request you to share your feedbacks with us and uh, um, also some of the questions which are not being answered we will uh, try to respond you uh, as a, pa a part of uh, our uh, after we send the presentations so now over to you Adya for thanking uh, Shuvendraji and others also. Thank you, Pramod. And uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers uh, for joining us. Uh, thank you, Mr. Suvendra uh, and Mr. Rajesh. Thank you, sir, uh, for this for your insightful presentations. Our, uh, we can all agree that our distinguished speakers have provided us with a comprehensive understanding of the key elements shaping this landscape. So as we wrap up today's webinar, I'm sure you will agree with me that the integration of energy data analytics into the power markets of South Asia holds immense potential for enhancing market efficiency, profitability, and resi resilience. So by embracing the decision-making uh, element from the data-driven analytics, we can all navigate the complexities of the power market, optimize operations and deliver value for our customers. So I encourage each one of you, whoever has joined us from uh, all parts of different countries to reflect on this knowledge of uh, you know, wealth imparted by our speakers today and consider how you can you know, apply these insights into your respective roles. So thank you to all our participants. And for an active uh, participation, I would call uh, all of you for a quick knowledge assessment uh, uh, that we have planned for today. So I'm going to uh, launch the knowledge assessment. It's a 10 questions round. So uh, we'll give you a couple of minutes to actually go through it. And let's test our knowledge. Uh, let's see how many of you got what we have uh, you know, imparted today. So it's it should be in front of you now. Yes, we have just gone. launched it. Yeah. Pramod, you were saying something? Yes, yes. Uh, we can see the questions have come up. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll keep ourselves mute for all the participants. And uh, it's 
multiple choice questions for all of you. Uh, have a go at it. Let's see how many of you will be able to pull that around. I think Shovanza Ji has left, uh, right? Yeah. It's okay. Our participants are here. Mm -hmm. Are we able to see the... I'm level? able to see. I'm okay. able to see uh, the participation level as of now. So around 10% of our audiences have participated. Uh, let's have more. Let's have more, please. <laughs> uh, have a go. These are multiple choice questions. And it's anonymous, by the way. So you are not recorded on your knowledge here. Are there, uh, just make Pramod also the co-host so that he's able to see the questions and the answers being given. Okay. So maybe we'll take one more minute and then start uh, responding to the. Mm -hmm. Let's give give the answers to you. The answers are still coming in. You will be able to see it now if you open the post. Yes, yes, yes. I'm able to. Okay, the participation has increased. It's twenty six percent now. Oh, great! More participation coming in. Thirty two percent now. Okay. In fact, most of the answers are also right. Uh, mm. There is some level of variation, but generally, the majority of the people are answering right. So. Our session was effective at least we can conclude with this. yeah yeah like around 50 percent of our participants now are participating so i'm sure they have all gathered some value from the session correct So another minute, guys, and then we'll close the poll, the assessment round. I think that's it. Yeah, I think. Yeah, we, we'll just, yeah I think okay. we can quickly read out the answers for them. Uh, so, uh, would you want me to do it or? You? Uh, could you? Ah, I can do it. So, uh, for the first question, uh, the power procurement planning is generally done on uh, which type? So, day ahead basis, uh, intraday, month ahead, long term. So, in fact, uh, majority of the people have answered correct, which is all of the above. So. Uh, in in case of India, it is done for uh, uh, in uh, day ahead, intraday as well as everyday basis. And uh, in in case of regional countries, I think it is different. But this is a general way wherein 
it's done on every day um, which is uh, the of the following is generally used uh, in electricity demand forecasting so the answer for uh, second is again all of that about uh, some of the people have mentioned historical load only but uh, as shuvendra ji has already explained the weather data seasonal data these are very important data so the answer for the two is all the above so answer for the three is basically um, 15 minutes so uh, 15 minutes is a time block in which uh, uh, scheduling is being done and uh, bidding is also happening in the power exchanges in the 15 minutes time block in case of uh, india and which which the other countries also participates in the similar exchange market so uh, 15 minutes is considered uh, there is a plan that it will later on shift to 5 minutes time block uh, then uh, answer for four is uh, which of the following is not a data analytical technique discussed today so uh, we we discussed uh, descriptive we discussed uh, predictive uh, diagnostic we didn't discuss preventive so preventive uh, was the answer for four uh, answer for five is uh, basically all of the above some of the people have mentioned it's only machine learning or statistical statistical analysis but uh, all all this including the data visualization comes under data analytics and again pro, pro, how the forecasting is done in, in is a question on in six so which is mostly done based on the predictive analysis so we are predicting the future demand or future price is uh, generally it is done with this uh, 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 model uh, for the uh, question number 7 uh, which of the following helps in taking forward informed decision in electricity trading and power market so uh, resource adequacy supply side projection demand assessment and uh, the availability of the systems and networks so essentially all of these are being used uh, to uh, predict uh, or take the informed decision uh, not uh, only one one of these are not taken all all of these are important for that uh, then banking term is basically uh, swapping of energy the last uh, part wherein uh, as explained by uh, one of the speakers that on certain period uh, one of the distribution companies uh, buys from power from the other distribution company uh, let's say in the winters and then in summers they uh, or in the case of excess power they 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 give that power and uh, the commercial uh, these are just a exchange of energy with certain charges associated with it uh, which kind of machine learning technique is which which of the following is a machine learning technique so uh, in fact the answer to this is all of the above supervised and unsupervised learning reinforcement learning natural language processing deep learning all these are part of uh, uh, machine learning uh, then the last question is uh, how the aggregated demand load curve for electricity uh, trade decision helps in understanding so uh, it, it's basically uh, again all of the above so where in the time block wise analysis is done that uh, peak and off peak analysis is been done seasonal variations are also being analyzed and basis this only the trading decisions are being uh, taken yeah so uh, that's it uh, adya so we can conclude i think uh, the session and uh, I, i hope that our next session on this will be in january yeah so we will we will look forward to all the participants uh, joining in part 2 of uh, uh, the south asia energy series and till then uh, i hope you uh, i wish you all a very great day uh, wherever you are